Meanwhile, back home, the rest of the gang lament the day's failings. Biggest payout we've ever seen, and she just lost it. She made a mistake. Name one time she has. She's young. Don't bullshit me. You were twice the person at half her age. You know what, Milo? You're right. There's a bunch of things Powder just can't do. Like complain about everything. What? And brag nonstop. Okay, okay, I see where this is going. Take fights with the group when we need to focus. Fine. <laughs> and tell strangers on the street that we got a nice call. Not to say there's nothing to roast Milo for, because there certainly is. Why is being a tad unfair here? Arguing with the group? If you're talking about this, then sure. Man, not again. I just got this shirt. Dude, who the hell cares about a shirt? You are being chased by the police. If they catch you, everything goes down the shitter. So hurry up and jump down the shitter. But aside from that, every time Milo bickers with the group, it's only after the action is behind them. And as for the boasting about the loot part, it's clear that Blondie was smelling treasure from the get-go, so it's not like Milo revealed anything. But I get it. Why is sticking up for powder? Downplaying someone's failings by overblowing others is not exactly the most mature route to take. But it makes sense for her to play favorites. After all, powder is the most dearest person in her life. And speaking of which, first time watching, I was praising to groan at this. She's young. Don't bullshit me. You were twice the person at half her age. You know what, Milo? You're right. There's a bunch of things Powder just can't do. You don't have to tell me twice. Like complain about everything. What? Oh no, Powder heard only the bad part. Before the all-important however. Drama caused by misunderstanding is among the laziest writing tropes. I was already envisioning this spiraling into some kind of ridiculous spat. People saying what they don't mean because they work off of differing premises. Things escalating, a falling out that leads to nothing except wasting screen time, that kind of deal. Luckily, the writers avoid such hackiness. No artificial teen drama in sight. Vi simply pops in to cheer Powder up, and the scene goes on from there. You wanna talk about today? What's the point? I ruined everything. I always do. Nobody said that. No, just that you were twice the person at half my age. I'm not a fighter. You don't have to be. Look, I've got these. And you've got those. They never work. They will. Why ends up giving some surprisingly mature encouragement? Everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. In order to grow, the priority should not be to compare oneself to others, but rather to focus on the things one has been gifted with. Despite her struggles, Powder clearly has an affinity for tinkering. The fact that she can envision and build even this tiny fart bomb is impressive in a way. She should follow this path, her own path, be the best version of herself, and not worry so much about how she measures up to others. For round two of sisterly bonding, Vi leads the pair outside. See that gutter running along the canal? That's where Clagger got his foot stuck running from enforcers. They thought it was funny, so they left him there. He was out all night before we found him. That sign? You see it? Huh? Milo tripped over his own paint bucket and nearly fell off trying to draw a giant middle finger. His ass made that splotch. <laughs> and that? When I was a kid, some guy took my favorite toy and threw it up there. I used to come out here at night and stare at it, hoping maybe the wind or a bird might knock it down. And as much as I would like to comment how cute and fun and wholesome this is, and leave it at that, I have to point out that the logic of this scene makes no sense. Why hands powder a random pipe? and that somehow helps her zoom in. 
you do know that the point of spy glass is the glass part, not just the hollowed out cylinder. And furthermore, how does Powder not know all of this already? This pep talk is framed as if Powder just emerged into the lives of everyone else. But that's obviously not the case. She's always been there. She would know about all of these incidents, considering how tight-knit this adoptive family is. If your family member gets stuck outside for a whole night, you will know about it. If your family member stamps their ass on a billboard, you will know about it. Those are the types of stories that would get referenced constantly. Every time someone messes up, the immediate response would be, Oh yeah, well it's not nearly as bad as when you did this and that. And as for the bunny, you are honestly trying to tell me that why Miss My Little Sister is my greatest treasure and our connection defines my existence on this planet and I want to do anything in my power to guide and protect her has never shared this major story before now. She kept coming back to watch the stuffed animal, so it must have been a big deal to her. And she never mentioned it? I don't buy it. Here we have a scene where the neat idea for character interaction has come first and foremost, and whether or not it makes sense in terms of physics or timeline-wise is secondary. Not a huge deal, just a silly mishap that could have been ironed out with a simple redraft. Ditch the pipe, just point and look, bring the objects closer. And for the stories themselves, just have Vi begin the sentence with Remember that time when... and go from there. Frame the scene as Vi reminding Powder, underlying the point she is going for, instead of revealing things she should by all logic know already. We've all had bad days. But we learn. And we stick together. Just to reiterate, in case it hasn't become apparent already, I really like the character work in this show. This dynamic is sweet. The aura of a guardian coming from Vi, and the pure innocent adoration from Powder. All of it is wholesome and endearing. I can believe these two fictional people love each other more than anything in the entire world. The episode has laid a great foundation for things to come, which is quite important, considering that this bond will be one of the most prominent plotlines in the show going forward. As for now, Powder reveals that not all of the loot was lost in the canal after all. The glowing gemstones from before are still in her pouch. What are they? I don't know. Should we show Vander? No. Let's keep this our little secret. I sure hope that won't blow in your faces later. I hope. And with that, the first episode of Arcane moves towards closing credits, with a sweeping shot of the grand stage, and the two leads of our tale basking in newfound determination, which is undercut ominously as we transition to a mysterious hidden underwater lair of evil. Oh! Now you fucked up! Blondie from before gets a deserved slap around courtesy of his employer for being an incompetent overzealous buffoon. You were supposed to follow them and not interfere. Now his accomplice is asking questions about you. And that's not a risk I'm willing to take. The kids, it was their fault. The explosion in the upper city. That was them. Vanders in trouble. Smartest thing you ever said, boy. Get him a meal. We'll keep him off the streets. Thank you, a genius at work. Keep the recognizable face off the street, because people actually do have eyeballs, and this little thing called memory. If people are, quote, asking questions, and looking for a person with clear distinguishable attributes, then you need to keep that person, who might slip up answers to those questions, 
Under strict house arrest. Something that Vander fails to do in a bit, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Aside from street smarts, this introduction to Silco, the central villain of the show, is nothing all too exceptional. All the basic ingredients are there. Moody lighting, cool voice, cool lair, cool fishies, sleek fashion sense, he's got this messed up eye gimmick going on, he's definitely got the flair of villainy down pat, he's even got a personal mad scientist working on horrid mutagens for vile purposes. Subject in my someone just volunteered. Oh my god! Yeah, so there's a major threat incubating in the seediest part of the city's seedy underworld. Okay, you got my attention. Let's see where this goes. Actually, let's jump ahead for a minute to episode two specifically, where we get a proper introduction to Silco's character, just to get a taste of what this person is all about. Just a taste? Just a taste. As a direct continuation to the previous scene, Silco offers Blondie a chance to redeem himself. There's a monster inside all of us. What? No. No, no, it'll kill me! I'd like to let you in on a very important secret I learned when I was about your age, boy. You see, power. Real power doesn't come to those who were born strongest, or fastest, or smartest. No, it comes to those who will do anything to achieve it. It's time to let the monster out. Silco is a fantastic manipulator. He knows exactly what strings to pull. He knows how to sell his vision. He sees the weakness, the bruised ego, Blondie here wishes to be a big shot, a made man, desperately acts the part, and then gets stomped to the ground by some random street urchin, the frustration eats him from the inside, Silco offers him the chance to strike back, a way to shed his former weak self, while using that exact same weak, self-serving, pathetic persona to his own advantage. And this speech is not merely a manipulation tactic. Silco himself believes in this philosophy. Take what you want, using any means necessary. It's an alluring ideal to sell to the weak-willed and power-hungry. It's easy to seduce people to one's side, promising power, wealth, notoriety, women, whatever they desire. If only they do this one thing for you, go on ahead, down this untested potion, that'll fulfill you. The problem for everyone else is that Silco will be the one at the top, puppeteering everything. He is a snake, and he knows that he is a snake. He practically admits it right here. He isn't the strongest, or the fastest, or the smartest. He just knows how to manipulate others to do his bidding. That is his gift. And in a cruel world, it's the gift that reigns above all the rest. Silco is my favorite character in Arcane. His ideals and desires are firmly defined. He is a despicable crime lord, planning to take over his city with any and all vile method imaginable, leaving a path of pain and destruction in his wake because he sees it as his born right, as the person above the rest, having the soul and the will strong enough to take it, he is ruthless, cunning, plans ahead, and is quick to adapt, and his innate charisma gives him the means to seize followers and resources, and use them as he pleases. Silco nails all the key factors to create an effective threatening villain, summed up and simplified, Every villain needs two attributes, a clear tangible goal, and the method in which to achieve it. Everything beyond that is just extra gravy, fantastic if you have it, but not strictly necessary to cook a juicy narrative steak. 
but Silco also has plenty more to offer, his backstory will eventually get fleshed out, tying him closely to the main cast for added dramatic effect, Plus, he acts as the classic dark reflection of the heroes and their desires. Very nice. And, and, as a special treat, he is actually one of those rare villains who gets... Drumroll! Character development! Yes, he is not only an obstacle creating trouble for the protagonists, he is a person, affected by the events around him the same as the rest of the cast. More on that eventually. And he is just fun to watch. He delivers each line and every motion with such deliciously alluring villainous energy, while never crossing to the side of Hammy, it's captivating. Kudos to the actor Jason Spisak, as well as the voice director, the animators, and anyone else responsible. This character steals every scene he is in. Silco's charisma is his greatest tool in universe. So it's fantastic that the show manages to sell that essence to the point that it oozes from the screen. Okay, enough gushing, time to wrap up episode 1. All in all, the opening chapter of Arcane is close to everything I could want from a beginning to a grander narrative. It introduces a cast of well-defined characters, a major conflict for the show, that all develop as time goes on, it offers insight to how and why the central characters act the way they do, their place in the world, as well as their desires for the future. The problems they face aren't only external, but also internal. The show establishes its tone, genuine drama, high stakes, organic bits of comedy sprinkled in. The dialogue is sharp, the mood is weighty, the characters feel alive. Despite its fantasy sensibilities and stylized look, the show aims for a reasonable amount of realism, it takes itself seriously and asks the audience to join in, and despite some fumbles here and there, it's written competently and compellingly. It's a solid opening episode, and I cannot see how anyone wouldn't be at the very least mildly curious to see where the story goes next. So, let's have a look next time. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long, and a special thanks to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, Six Stars, and Danny Kicks. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.